We've gotten to know you by, by the things you've put on the screen and the things you've said. And I think that I, I just want to throw some things that you've said. Uh-oh, okay. And, uh, <laughs> that, I, that I like and, and see if what, which of these resonate with you and which would you like to change or, you know, modify. Okay. So the first thing you said was, let's talk about our lives in the most real, honest way we can. I love that. That's great. Every set of eyeballs counts. Sometimes having constraints is a good thing, honestly. If we played even the, the tiniest role in helping to defeat Prop 8 and giving all the gay people the equal rights they deserve, then I'm a happy man. The two happiest days of a boat owner's life is the day he buys a boat and the day he gets a terrorist out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Right? It's as simple as people having to stick to their guns. Uh, it's okay to disconnect with the character because it will feel so much better when we reconnect with him here. Mm -hmm. It's our job to take good ideas, whether they come from the head of the network or the, they come from the security guard. Uh, when you... Uh, you don't even need me here. This sure. is perfect. <laughs> yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> when somebody asked you when you knew you had made it, you said, when I went to eat to Tween Acres here in Chicago, and they set a table for 10 people without getting in line. So, great. Another thing, um, these, these two are my favorite. The first one says, I want to thank me for hiring me when nobody want, else would. <laughs> That's great. And this one, my favorite, God, I sound like such a liberal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah. <laughs> kind of, I wanted to give, instead of going through your CV, I, I thought that, going through your words. I have said some right interesting idea. things <laughs> 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 for various reasons, in effect. The, the one that I don't get is the, the boat one. Where did that come from? Yeah, that, you, that, yeah, well, <laughs> So, Something needed to be said that night. I think. All right, let's. I have other things that you know, other things you've said, and, and that we, I think we, we should talk about a little bit. Uh, you had a degree in journalism from the University of Wisconsin. Sort of. Sort of. Okay. Um, I was in the School of Communications, and uh, and then I started. I actually got an internship in my between my junior and senior year here at WLS-TV uh, in Chicago doing uh, in the newsroom. And I had taken some journalism classes and, and my interest in journalism was growing, mm -hmm. um, you know, mostly because I wanted to be on TV, <laughs> uh, more so than I was a very serious journalist who had to get to the truth. Uh, so um, uh, I, my senior year, I then got an internship at the local ABC affiliate where I went to school in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, um, I was actually on air. Uh, I parlayed that internship. To, I kept bugging him, let me get on air, let me get on air. And, and they finally did, which was like, something that they hadn't done. And, um, and my journalism professor was the nighttime or the six o'clock anchor. So there were some really weird times when um, during the day I'm a student in his class and then it, night, uh, he's throwing it to me live on, set, <laughs> on scene somewhere in the news. And it was very weird. But I, I ma managed, because I, I made the switch rather late, I was sort of like a, sort of a double major, you know, mostly communications, but with an emphasis on journalism. And that's how, uh, that's, and that's what I thought was going to be my career. Yeah, I, you know, most of the people who want to go to television, they usually go th through the journalism emphasis because there's no other option. Well, it's, uh, I always say, you know, when you're from Chicago, especially back then, um, there was no access to Hollywood. It felt like a million miles away. And, and so, so when you think about, oh, I, you know, I love, I'm fascinated by TV and the media and all those things. Well, who are the biggest stars back, this is back then, a million years ago. Um, <laughs> who were the biggest stars on, on TV? 
you know, and, and for me, they were the local news guys. I mean, they were news, TV news was so much bigger than you guys had, have no clue. But TV <laughs> news was, was such a, you know, it was a really big thing. Everybody watched it at night, and those guys were stars, and they were right. breaking all these things. And, and I thought, well, that was, you know, just fascinating. And, uh, and because I didn't think that, this, that, that, that Hollywood was possible. It didn't seem real to me. It seemed so far away. But you liked it. I mean, did you watch those shows and you said... Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I watched way too many shows growing up. Oh. And, uh, um, and I really, I, I was enamored of the whole form. And, I, you know, something about it I connected with on a deep level. But I didn't, I just never thought this was possible. So that was my, you know, everything I did, when I look back on my career, it all seems, now I can trace it. It's all, every step was a little bit closer to the creative purity of, like, you know, yeah. pure, yeah, of what I do now, uh, as opposed, you know, but it took some steps to, to get me there. Do you think that, I get the sense that you felt then that there was no other way, I mean, you had to go to journalism and through that route, but do you think I, that it didn't even, it wasn't even a think of like, well, this is my way to get to Hollywood, it wasn't yeah. even, that was, a, that was not a possibility, this was like, wow, I can maybe be on the local news, because I had seen those people, yeah. and the, you know, those were real people to me, and and I knew a guy who knew a guy who was on the news, so that seemed like a real thing to me. Yeah. And then, you know, as I always say, when I when I then I got into advertising and I worked at Leo Burnett. I, after I, I decided I didn't want to do news, I was I realized I was doing it for all the wrong reasons, <laughs> and and I and I got and a friend of mine, got, I got him an internship. I was working there, and I got a friend of mine an internship at the same station, and. Um, he cut a little demo thing on his first day, and I, on his first day, I, I honestly, I said, he's better than I am. It was his first day. I mean, he was so smooth, and he could, he could remember his little stand-ups, <laughs> and I was like stumbling over myself. And every time I would talk, and I would do my little, you know, uh, live from, my voice was always getting really high, <laughs> and I, you know, I'd be talking to you like this, and I would do my, you know, okay, we're ready to go. Okay, three, two, one. It seems that the people are, you know, I was just nervous, and, and, and so he was just smooth and, and right. great. And, and I realized, well, if this is the first guy that I bring in who's not even a professional, who's my competition, you know, I'm just supposed to just be helping out, is, a, is way better than me. This does not bode well for my future in this business. <laughs> and so um, I, I, I came here. I wanted to live in Chicago. I wanted, to, I wanted to be in a big city. And I moved back here, and I took a job, and eventually got to Leo Burnett. And... Um, and so that was great. It was big media. It was creative. I loved the creative process. And I was much happier being creative. I never really mm -hmm. was that taken with the facts. And I, I like to you know, <laughs> have a little more fun with it. And so um, I started doing, uh, got the chance to shoot a few commercials in LA. And while in LA, yeah. I met some people who were tangentially involved in the business. And it was at that moment where I, I sort of said to myself, well, oh my God, well, these are, wait a minute, these are real people. Like, these are people, <laughs> and we're the same species, and uh, <laughs> I'm able to keep a conversation going with them. So, you know, maybe it's actually real. Uh, it didn't seem real at all until mm -hmm. that point. So uh, that's when I realized that maybe I should go for it. And what do you do? Well, I had, been, I had write, written some TV spec scripts along the way, mm -hmm. um, even when I was in news. I, I started writing them with absolutely no clue what to do with them. I, mm -hmm. I really didn't know. And um, uh, I, I, you know, it's funny, like I, my friends would go, what are you doing? Like, why are you sitting at home <laughs> writing these scripts? I'm like, I, I really don't know. I, it's like, you know, <laughs> I felt like I was like that guy in, you know, and uh, like, it was not, it was, like one step more sane than the guy who was like building a rocket in his backyard, <laughs> and um, and uh, but I but I, I enjoyed it and I thought well let me just see if I can do it and then I want to see if I could do it better and blah blah blah, and so finally I, I had a, a a small body of work, and when I went to L.A. I you know would try to get people to read it, and you went to to L.A. with a job in the industry. To, to, well, originally to shoot some commercials, right. you know, through Leo right, Burnett, right. and then I realized I got some advice from someone who said, you have to move, move here. If, you're, if yeah. you want to work in TV comedy, you got to move here. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, ultimately. Now, you know, it's a little bit less the case now. There's a, there's a bit of a scene in New York. Sure. Um, you know, hopefully, we hopefully can bring something in here. Chicago would sure. be great. Um, but at the time, it was the only game in town or yeah. in not in town. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I did. I picked up and I moved, and I got a job there doing advertising as yeah. a way to move me out there. I didn't want to have to uh -huh. pay for my own move and, uh, <laughs> and have to wait tables. So I took a job doing that, and then it was, you know, I spent about a year, year and a half, you That's know, will you read my script and all that, which is, you know, it felt like an eternity, and it was ridiculously fast. Um, I, heard, I heard from someone that said that you, you had a great cheer spec that they loved and then, you know, oh. that opened doors, oh, is that true? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it was one of my specs. It, what, what, actually what happened was I r had written, I came back from LA one day when I was here working in Chicago, and I came back and I remember this very distinctly. I was, I had two scripts. Didn't think they were either were quite good enough to get me a job, but I was now oh, like sure. very inspired. I had a good time. I must have had a really good time in LA that trip. and. Uh, and uh, I came back really inspired, and I, and I went into my office um, on a uh, Sunday morning, and I sat down at about 9 a.m., alone in, in my office at, at Leo Burnett, and I left at about 8 that night with a S Wonder Year script. Wow. And I just blasted it off. I don't think I've written a script that fast since. I mean, that's <laughs> ridiculously fast. And I, I don't... I haven't read it in years, but probably not that good. But <laughs> it, at the time, it was. It felt great, and um, the story worked. So, uh, so, so it, it, it was. You know, it was. It was easy to write. When a story works, it was easy to write. So I sat down. I wrote that, and then, um, long story short, I got somebody to read it, and they encouraged me. They said, you know, it was really good. Uh, it was somebody actually from the Wonder Years, and he said, the good news is. Or the bad news is that we, we just shot a show that is the same story. It's very similar. It hasn't aired yet, but we just shot it, and uh, so that's the bad news. The good news is, is that yours is better. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that was very, very encouraging to me. Um, and so I talked to an agent. He, he hooked me up with an agent, and then the agent said, well, I need two scripts. You have something else. I said, well, I have a Cheers. And he said, great, send them to me. And so I hung up the phone and said, okay, I've got to write a Cheers. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so I did. And uh, I just stayed after work and, um, you know, sat home and, and you know, just pounded and through a Cheers it. until I, you know, had something that I thought was, was funny enough to send them. Because um, I felt like the clock was ticking. Yeah. So it was great motivation for me. And... Uh, it led to a phone call. I remember getting a phone call on an answering machine uh, saying, you know, this is so-and-so from some agency, and, you know, I read your script, and it's amazing, and I love it, and it's fantastic, and you're going to be a big star, and then nothing happened. I thought, <laughs> I, was on, I, thought I was on the road, you know, <laughs> and nothing, nothing happened. I mean, nothing happened from that. Oh. So I rea really did realize I had, I had to had move. To, you had to go there. Yeah. And then the the first one what was it was the critic the first one? No, the first thing I I did was I got a, I got a chance to pitch at the show Wings. Uh, Wings, okay. A million years ago, and then it was great. And yeah. then uh, I pitched a story there, and they liked it, and then I, I wrote it, and um, they uh, liked. They well, I turned in the script, which is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I turned in the script, and uh, and then it, and the season hadn't begun quite yet. And then they, when I went into the office, turned in. They said, "You know, we're shooting our first show Friday night. Why don't you come and watch the okay. show?" And so, um, my wife and I went to the show, or my then girlfriend and I went to the show, <laughs> and uh, and we, uh, um, I was so nervous. I, I can't tell you how nervous I was. I was sitting in the audience, and and I walk in there's. The, there's that set and there's those cameras and I was just like, how do these people act? You know, and how do these people do this and blah, blah, blah. And, and I was really excited because they invited me, but then it really dawned on me that they invited me before they read the script. And what if they hated it? And now I'm <laughs> sitting there like an idiot and no one, and so then we're, now we're sitting there, I'm like, no one, you know, someone kind of waves to me like, that wasn't much of a wave. It was just like a little, like, this is, oh shit, I'm sitting there and blah, blah, blah. And um, and we they shoot the whole show and after that one of the creators of the show invited me down onto the set and uh, asked me to join the staff. 
that was really cool. So it was a really amazing sure. moment. Yeah, uh, it must have been great. Uh, I think I was uh, around that time. I was just married, and we went to the wing set uh, as a trip. We took my wife and I went to Paramount Studios, and they took us to the wing set, and we said, oh. I was just like, Dude, yeah, wow, it's, it's pretty daunting it's when you're when you're this <laughs> starstruck by the business to see one of those sets and see right. it, it's all it all. I mean, now I take it so for granted, right. and you know, it's funny for like my kids, my my daughter's here, and I and I uh, that's my daughter, everybody. Hey. Uh, <laughs> and you know, she grew up on sets, and it's so weird because her life is. I think about how different her life is than mine, um, where you know I was so, you know, just nervous being being just being there and seeing it all, and you know, for her, and especially for my son, he walks in, he's like, where's the craft service I need candy <laughs> like you can care less about anything you know so um, right. it's a very different you upbringing change, which is why course. so many people in LA just naturally for them yeah, it's for them. you know it's a company town it's just it's like going to work in the coal mine you know they well you know that's, that's what my parents that's did what it and is. that's what I do so uh, it's it's different so from there a bunch of shows you know critic Larry Sanders show uh, and and then Brazier yeah, Fraser, uh, Fraser, uh, Wings, Fraser. Well, actually, if you want to be technical, sure. Wings, Critic, Critic, while working on Wings, uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Fraser while working on Wings, <laughs> then Larry Sanders, <laughs> and then back to Fraser. Back to Fraser, and then while on Fraser, uh, just shoot me. Shoot me. Oh, that's right. And by the way, where's the rest of just shoot me? I, I bought the two only seasons know, that they have I, on DVD, I, and been talking there's nothing. About this. Uh, <laughs> just shoot me was always that little show that could and kind of was lived in the shadows of a number of other uh -huh. shows that were you know so big at the time. But um, yeah, we, we, we like used to, to love it. it. I mean, no, we I used to watch it all the time. And thank you. Actually, there's one one great moment where David Spade as Finch, he's perfect to pick gifts. For 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 people, and he says, you know, th then and, and George is asking him to pick presents for important people because they he wants to make business with them. Have you ever had done that? Have you ever had to pick a present that is? I'm just trying to remember this scene that <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> well, it was a long time ago. Yeah, sure. and yeah. we remember laughing that. Yeah, no, that, it was that a, it was a really <laughs> nice show. I mean, I was very happy with it, and <laughs> it was the first thing I literally literally I had never. I mean, other than a couple, <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird. Other than a couple of short stories in college, I had never created m characters, uh -huh. you know, fresh like that ever. So I, you know, I didn't know if I could, and you know, it's a very different um, mindset. Yeah, skill set. I was going to say set. that sure. that you know, uh, I know a lot of r wonderful writers who. Uh, are really good at getting on a show that exists and then learning the voice of that show and writing it well. And it's a whole nother deal to create a show and I just really had no clue mm. if I could uh, at all because I had never ever done it. So uh, Just Shoot Me was the first thing that I tried and I, and, and I got you know very lucky mm. out right out the gate. It was really great. I, we, we still carry those characters with us. And it was good, I mean it was, a, it was an interesting, I don't know, you guys probably, had, many of you probably haven't even seen it, but it should. It, it, Go it, look it, for it. It's a, uh, you know, it, it was always, uh, what I'm always looking for, or, or, you know, I think what everybody should look for is, that, you know, you have an idea, but like at the, what's at the heart, you know, it's a bunch of people at an office or whatever it is, but what's the, what's at the heart of that? And, you know, for me, that was about a mother, I mean, excuse me, about mm -hmm. a, uh, there are a couple of big ideas at play there. It was a, it was a, you know, very troubled relationship between a father and daughter. And it was also, a, you know, sort of a, what I thought was an interesting, or a look at an, a subject that I found interesting, which was like, what's the role of physical beauty mm. in our society? And how it plays such an unu you know, strange role and people have many different points of view about it. And I thought that was just interesting. So yeah. I try to start with some truths and some things, areas that you wanna Explore. play around with. Um, you know, in the beginning, and then and then you build a show either around that or around some good mm -hmm. characters or whatever that is. And that's the successes, and you don't want to talk about the uh, failures. I'll talk about failures. All right. <laughs> we could be here all night. <laughs> I got a bunch well, of them. That's the that's the thing. I I every time I've talked to somebody 
who, who has, you know, has something that's happening to them right now and they're successful, they, they usually say, well, I have a ton of other things that you, you know, if you want to know the truth, it, they haven't been that well received. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I could argue, I could argue that, well, this one would have worked if it had yeah. been on a different network, or this uh, one would have worked if it had a different lead, or whatever it is, and that's fine. You know, I'm not, I'm not uh, hiding behind that or anything like we're saying. I'm, see, I'm so great that no, it didn't work, and that's fine, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's just the way it is. But but because it's a miracle when they work. You know, you're putting a show together when typically when everybody else in the world is putting shows together so you're all grabbing for talent and you're writing under pressure and you're coming up you know and it's a it's a terrible terrible process um, so when it actually does come together uh, it's a miracle it, it, it is it's, it's a miracle and when it comes together especially in a, in a way that feels very special you know like when you look at Friends or Seinfeld or you know we can name a million of them you know hopefully Modern Family uh, you know where Modern Family we had to cast ten actors during pilot season and uh, you know we saw our casting director saw for those ten roles saw fourteen hundred actors fourteen hundred actors for ten roles <laughs> and of of those I saw probably four hundred or my Ooh. partner and I saw four hundred so. Uh, we could have made terrible mistakes. We tried to make terrible mistakes. <laughs> you know, some actors that we made offers to that didn't want to do it or whatever, and, and that show would have been very different. And it wouldn't, right. it wouldn't be what it is. Maybe it would have been okay. <laughs> Maybe it would, whatever. It would have been different. Yeah. And so it's a miracle when it when it happens. When it happens. A happy miracle. I th I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you learn from those those failures. Do do you take something out yeah. of that? You know, I remember. I remember liking Back to You, for example, yeah. and, and watching Ty. That was the first time I saw Ty yeah. on, on a television screen, and, and he, well, was, he was killing it. Yeah, like Ty Burrell is one of those things that you say, well, do you take anything from, the, from your failures? Well, yeah, you take Ty Burrell. <laughs> 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 so, um, well, what a wonderful th thing yeah, to, to, yeah. to get, right? <laughs> yeah, because uh, you go, well, this guy's brilliant, and he just sure. hasn't found the right thing yet, but he's brilliant. We knew he was brilliant, and so we wrote Phil Dunphy for him, and it was a real challenge to get him approved by the network, but we did. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was a real challenge, believe me. And, but you know, yeah, you have. If you're smart, you 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 do. You try to take what you can, um, because you do. You know, it's inevitable that you're going to make some mistakes, and you say, well, it's hard to go. Well, I'm never going to make that mistake again because sure. maybe you will, or maybe you'll make a cousin of that mistake again because <laughs> it's it's just such a. Uh, mercurial process and you're on the fly and decisions are made you know really under pressure it's crazy so I, I just feel you know you you do your best you say well you know what I'm now I'm gonna stick with my gut I, I cast that guy because they were all lo in love with them but I don't like him and you know by the time we got him on film he sucked and it was you know it wasn't funny and I knew he wasn't funny it's just because he's handsome and <laughs> handsome isn't funny and <laughs> <laughs> that guy and you know <laughs> That's what you take from it. So right. you, you know, you know, and, and, and things like that, and 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 you also, you you learn when you've built a boat. I always say like it's like building a boat. Uh, a pilot is a boat, and everybody uh, tells you how pretty your boat is, and you start to believe how pretty your boat is, and then at some point, they take you and they put you in the boat and they shove you out in the middle of the ocean, <laughs> and if your boat has a bunch of holes in it. There's nobody <laughs> else there. They are. They are. They're back on shore, going, "You idiot!" <laughs> and you're sinking. And and you know, you're shark food. And and that's what, that's what I always think that you can't trust anybody, at all to say. Hmm. When it's good or you know when it's bad or when it's good, uh, you have to you have to trust your own instincts or, and or, you know, you go to your friends who you know know. You know, the smartest people you've worked with, who've been in the trenches with you, um, who have done shows. Because when you've been on a show that has poorly drawn characters, those are the shows that are up, staying up all night trying to come up with jokes for these right. characters. Because, you know, comedy is not about, um, or, you know, a TV comedy, a good TV comedy, is not about a bunch of guys who work at a newspaper or a dentist's office or whatever or uh, 
you know, a bunch of people who uh, see it on the bar. It's in the bar. It's about, you know, to use that example, it's about, you know, uh, an alcoholic ex pitcher ladies' man who is very much uh, kind of a, sort of a dumb jock, good heart, but a dumb jock, and an overeducated woman who's too much in her brain and not enough in her heart who uh, is strangely attracted to that guy and she's a snob and there mm -hmm. you know it's about that and you know it's it's character you know character is everything and and premise is nothing premise means nothing and because premise goes away mm. premises may be your pilot and you know premises makes for better movies yeah. TV shows are you know characters setting up some characters that are you're going to say Every time those two people are in the same room and they start talking about something, it's funny because they come at it from two such different points of view. And that's where I see so many mistakes made. Because I can do an hour on this, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll condense it. But I talk about this a lot with people where, you know, you start with a, a character. Is a, I always say it's an it's a empty circle. Uh, you know, okay, I'm going to have a, the main guy, okay. Well, now it's empty circle. Let's let's fill him out. Wh who is he? Is he so he's a ladies' man and he's insecure and he's this and he's that and he and you give him as many attributes as you can to fill him out, and then you say, well, okay, he can't exist in a vacuum because that's not funny. So who's he going up against? Because right. comedy comes from conflict. So you know, a la the Odd Couple, you know, who's the Felix to his Oscar? Who's the Diane to his Sam? So. Uh, you you come up with somebody else. Well, I'm going to give him this person who's this and that and whatever. And then you g now you have two people who are, so there's a, they're standing in direct, you know, opposite okay. of each other. But then that's two characters. and That's not a series. And so what I see, first of all, I see very few series that people get that right. You know, where they're mm -hmm. really well well drawn from the beginning of what the there's a there's a natural, you know, there's a natural mm -hmm. fight between them. But now, then now you orchestrate it, you, or you say, well, we've got to have the pretty girl, and you've got to have the, you know, the dumb guy, or the, this guy, or the weird guy, or the brother, because he needs, he needs a, someone to talk to, and whatever. And yet you're left with, often, a bunch of characters who have no Nothing. points of view that are interesting or in direct contrast. So now, you know, I always, so, it's, so, you, it's, so if you have those two main characters, I always say, well, it's, it's not about those characters. It's about the line between them. So that's the dynamic. And so the more crackling that line is between those mm -hmm. two points, the, m the better the, the show is. So now you put in a bunch of other points, and now you have to draw lines not only between those two characters, but between all the characters. Every character, you got to say, how does that bartender interact with the main guy? How does a bartender interact with the sister? How does the... And you have to understand what the dynamics are. Because if you don't, you're just doing jokes. And you know those shows, and sometimes they work. Yeah. They're never really great, but they're, they can be funny and they can be successful, but they're probably not great. They're probably not those beloved shows that sur survive the, you know, stand the test of time. The ones that stand the test of time have built it, you know, it's cheers. Same. You know, you knew what was funny about Carla and Cliff. You know, that was a funny dynamic right off the bat. And you know what was funny about Cliff and Norm. And you know what was funny about, you know, Coach and Diane uh, or Woody and, you know, you just knew what was funny. So that's what, so that you didn't have to write, you weren't dependent on jokes. You, you know, they, they had great jokes, but, get, but the great comedy can come from character. Mm. And when it comes from character, that's where it's just deepest and most meaningful and easy to write. And I, I remember you said two things. Find, work with your friends, people that you trust. Uh, Christopher Lloyd, obviously one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that, that you spend two months or three months developing characters. And then after you have that, you have a good Bible, then e writing the scripts is easier. Right. The, you know, there, there's, there's that. So you start with that. You know, we spend two months. Yeah you know, just coming up with the dynamics for Modern Family before we Start work. started working on the story. There's a, there's a famous old line, you know, one screenwriter says uh, to another screenwriter, what, how's your new, you know, how's your new screenplay going? He says, well, I just, uh, I just finished outlining the story 
and I'm about to start the draft, so I'm 95% done. <laughs> and that's the other part. You know, story is everything. Right. You know, uh, so it, from a pilot standpoint, character is everything. And from an individual episode standpoint, story is everything. If you have a solid story, uh, when we do like a rewrite, when we have a script that comes in, um, you know, we, we break the stories together and everything. But when a story really works, we could do the rewrite in, you know, no time. Sometimes, you know, half a day or something like that, fast. If the story's not working, it, that's two and a half days. Because to figure that out, why it's not working, that's the big picture. When a story's really working, it's just so much easier. You're just putting on jokes is, you know, it's like, you know, if it's just putting on ornaments on a, you know, on a really strong, healthy <laughs> Christmas tree. It's, you know, w when the tree is falling every time you put an ornament on it, and, you know, that's when you're in trouble. So, uh, yeah, so character first, story, story second, second. All right. and then jokes and are the fun part. The, the way I understand it, uh, do work in a very peculiar way for Hollywood, which is you divide the writer's room. Yeah. You take half the writer's room and work with it, then Chris takes the other half and work with, with them, and it's then you cross over or something Yeah, like that? it's not quite, um, you know, where we just take people and then we have these two teams, but it, what happens is it kind of it started from the fact that a, well, what happened was in the very beginning of the show, we you know we're both Chris and I had run shows before on our own. Mm -hmm. Suddenly we're running a show together and we're both type A's and we're both right. you know have strong opinions, <laughs> and we come at things from very different places. So yeah. we find ourselves butting up against each other a lot. And when you were in a like like the guys who created Frasier, there there were three of them at the time, and there was a you know tie. You know, majority rules. So two against one, we're going to go this yeah. way. Well, it's one against one, we could argue it out all day, but this is a gigantic waste of our time. So we came up with the idea of, well, why don't we just take turns being in charge? So this week you get final say, next week I get final say. And then over the years, that has evolved to really, and then we would weigh in very strongly on the other person's shows and blah, blah, blah. And I think as the show has gone on and as the staff has gotten more and more senior and, and um, you know, as we trust, the, you know, these guys more, have been sure. amazing and been there since the beginning and they're really incredibly talented. So we've got a great staff supporting us. So now we can basically, we're, we, we're more efficient if we split it in two. Because we also, I'm on set, you know, all week when we're shooting one of my shows and then Chris is in the room getting the next week's show ready mm -hmm. and then we flop. So it, it works beautifully. On, a, on other shows where there's like one showrunner, um, you know, there's a, quite often a bottleneck where the cast or the staff has come up with a, an idea, but they got to run it by Same. the showrunner, but he's busy on set and then he's got to run into editing and da da da. So this is kind of a perfect, perfect mm -hmm. situation where it allows us to run at, you know, top efficiency, even though it's a little bit weird because it's like two different shows really but the the what keeps it from feeling i think to the uh, we we kind of know the difference a little bit between our shows um the staff could knows the difference like i have a certain kind of show i like chris has a certain kind of show he likes in general it, it often goes back you know that that changes but i think the the fact that we have such a strong writing staff and they're working on both mm -hmm. of our shows it makes it even out and it makes it feel less different because we mm -hmm. still have you know, six or eight people in the room contributing to it who are contributing to both. When when uh, Christopher was asked, uh, how do you compliment each other? He says, he doesn't compliment me nearly enough. <laughs> <laughs> but then he says that, that you're the crazy one, that you're the, c the one that comes with the offbeat ideas, the, you know, that goes, and he's more like a dog with a bone, right? Stays yeah, I mean, we're, we're, that's a lot of, I'm very, well, one of our writers said, uh, I break story, uh, and I, I don't know if this is true or not, I really <laughs> okay. don't, but it, it's just what he said, so <laughs> he said, uh, you know, Chris comes at stories from his head, and I come at stories from my heart, okay. and, I, and I'll often just go, I don't know, I just have this notion, this feeling that, you know, there's a, I, I see this thing where, where, you know, the thing with a tooth fairy, and, <laughs> you know, there's, you know <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll just get this idea, and it'll just feel right to me, and Chris is very much into um, you know, more uh, uh, complex 
you know, story structure, block, you know, things that happen that come back around. And I like, I like a little bit more things to feel a little bit more, um, just like they're happening in real life without a lot of machinations. Mm. And and, it, and and they're both very valid. Yeah. And I think that's the strength of the show that we're not always doing the same kind of episodes each week. So, um, you know, I could ask people here, you know, uh, what are your favorite episodes? And half of you would break my heart. <laughs> but uh, yeah. right, no, right? No, no. But it's uh, no. But it would be. I, I mean, I think it's a strength of the show that 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 they're all they're really good episodes right. that are coming from you know both sides of that of that coin. I think I think you do compliment it. I mean, it may not be compliments on the same show, but it compliments the 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 season in, in its entirety. I think. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it somehow it somehow works. Yeah, yeah. And so we <laughs> it don't mess with it. Very well. Much. We don't. <laughs> yeah. uh, now it's great. It's it's doing amazing. Uh, uh, you're starting on syndication. That's that's heaven for television. What's that? Why why is it heaven for for television producer to be on syndication? Everybody wants to be on syndication. Why? That's where the money is. Or what? Uh, yeah. It's not. It's not bad. <laughs> I you know some of the complaints you hear is that yeah you know, it's uh, while while you're producing the show, it's not that good. But once you get into syndication, that's where really things are happening. Well, you know you're you know most of the time, most shows are operating at a loss. Yeah. Until that point, now you're still making a salary and all mm -hmm, that stuff. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, you're operating at a loss. So um, uh, we've actually managed not to be at a loss. A loss. That's really good. Uh, uh, but even before syndication, because of the way we we, we produce the show, but um, uh, it is yeah that's the that's, <laughs> that's the goal yeah. There, there is, <laughs> Congratulations! You know, there are many goals. I'm really there's happy. A creative <laughs> goal, and there's another goal. And a, right. In in about a minute, we're gonna start to take uh, questions from the audience. If you want to prepare your questions and make your way up to the microphones, uh, uh, please do so. Um, but I have other questions then. Uh, you said that you've managed to keep it uh, on the black. But you also have the highest paid actress in, in television working for you. Well, we don't pay her right? the highest pay. Pepsi pays her. <laughs> right, uh, it's Kmart most of it. Right, right, right. right. And uh, <laughs> 20 other products pay her. Uh, well, yeah, no, I mean, she's, Sophia, um, you know, has, has, she's a very smart, very, very savvy uh, person with a good team behind her, and she's really ma you know managed to take this moment, which is a perfect moment, yeah. you know, using her the right way. I'm um, not as some you know sex pot, you know, uh, and and take that image of this of this strong you know sexy Latin woman at a time when that was right. You know, sure. it was right. I mean, there you know that obviously that market is growing, and she crosses over and. You know, I mean, the <laughs> the crazy part of of Sophia's how she can get away with saying, um, you know, the things she does, and she's still likable. Like I'll walk in, and she's putting on lipstick, and I'll say, you know, and, and she'll, I go, oh, I go, oh, Sophia, you look you look pretty today, and she goes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's like it just so works. Right, right. It's like just something about her, the way she can do that. It's right. I don't know. It's just crazy the way like and women like don't they women you know that would like turn off most women and women love her and <laughs> you know because I don't know she says she can just get away with crazy you know but what's you know good there you know what we learned and I kind of learned this from another show I'll, I'll give you a good example mm -hmm. I did a show um, that I should not talk talk about <laughs> okay no but I did a show years ago called Stacked with Pam Landers. Mm -hmm. And um, th there's a whole story there. Um, <laughs> but we're not going to go into But, you know, I, what was interesting, what I wanted to do there, it's a long, long story how that came about, but at the end of the day, I said, I want to, you know, try to redefine, her, you know, uh, to her, I said, I want to redefine you. I, it's time for you to stop playing this, you know, this, this image that you have. And, and, you know, she was a mom and, um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, she had a quirky sensibility, but she had a good relationship with her kids, and that's what she... Well, um, the character didn't have kids, mm -hmm. and, and, and Pam wasn't quite ready to give up who she was. Mm -hmm. But um, that, 
she, she yeah. wasn't ready to let go of the sort of the full on, you know, yeah. sexual Gorgeous. goddess sure. that she is. And um, Sophia, on the other hand, you know, because of Gloria, and Gloria is much, is, is a, has a lot in common with Sophia. I mean, Sophia's got a 21 year old son now, oh, wow. something like that. Um, and Sophia is very close with her son and very protective of her son. Mm -hmm. And and the difference is that you don't have to say you're a, oh this character is a big sexy she's mm -hmm. sexy and we talk about how sexy she is and she's she's always coming in and men are you know make her a fiercely devoted mom and a fiercely protective mom and people will like her and they're going to notice that she's sexy <laughs> like you know <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they're going to kind of get that right. somehow. <laughs> Uh -huh. And and that's the you know that was one of the things that I just you know it was it's not brain surgery or rocket science or brain surgery but it's it 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 was a big difference I mean if we had yeah. if I had you know I look back and I go well if I we'd given her character a son and you know there were also there were other issues with that show but you know that would have been a much more likable mm -hmm. character you know if you had seen a, a cool relationship between her and a kid. That would have been a, the best way to redefine her, not right. the way that we did it. So I, I blame myself, but it was a lesson that I took forward. Again, learning from the past and the things you've done. Right. And um, I, I, I was wondering about this. Uh, she's, she's, uh, you're right, she, he, she's getting a lot of the money from you know, the sponsorships and the things that she's doing. But still, that represented a uh, negotiation standpoint for you. You go into syndication. Going into the the next uh, season, and uh, actors come by and say, you know, we want to negotiate, mm -hmm. and it's n it's fair. I think uh, most of the actors, certainly not for Ed O'Neill or, or or for Julie Bowen, who are who have been there forever on television, but some of these actors may only have one or two chances to to make it on television, mm -hmm. and they they do want to negotiate and have the best amount of money they can have with this show. Is that hard? Does that compromise us a little bit on critique? There's a natural dance that goes on when you do a show. I mean, yeah. it's, just, it's as, an, as inevitable as, you know, as yeah. any part of the process. What happens is you make your deals with the actors, and if the show, if, a, if the show is a big bomb, by the way, and loses money for the studio, nobody comes forward and says, I want to give some of this money back. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's okay. But if a show is a big success, there is an inevitable thing that happens at about year three. Mm, right. It's kind of like, you know, set your watch by it, that the actors are going to want to renegotiate. Sure. And, um, you know, it's not anything to get that upset about at all. And the only thing that I look back on with some regret over the last time is that I thought there were some that that it could have been handled better on both sides now, I'm not directly 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 involved in okay. negotiations I mean there's a studio and, mm -hmm. and all that but everybody could have handled it sooner more quietly mm -hmm. there's some people who get in m some agents and managers and lawyers who get in and like to stir it up and it, it leads to it, it becoming public I don't think that serves the show well right. at all Sometimes that's inevitable, but it was a very quick blip. During that blip, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. during that big that thing of like, oh no, this very, you know, we were still talking to the cast. Sure. I mean, they're my, they're my friends, of course. And by the way, Chris Lloyd and I want to see our friends share right. in the success of the show. We certainly don't want you know the show to be a gigantic success and then there, you know, there's somebody over there going, damn it, I I, I didn't make a big enough deal in the beginning oh. and now I'm. You know, we want everyone to feel good, come to work feeling good, and get their fair share of the show. And you know, that's what it inevitably happens. It's like you can again, <laughs> you there's no there's not even a there's no spoiler alert or like right, how's right, this right, going right. to end. It always ends the same way. You settle somewhere in the middle. It all right. works its way out. It's, it works its way, and, and everybody's happy in the end. And that's kind of what happens. I think I think that that uh, that's smart business too. I mean, you you sharing in the profits. Uh, you have more committed people there, you know, oh to yeah, work. Oh absolutely, hundred percent. So it's not just that. So I, uh, it's great. So we were again going to take some some uh, questions from the audience in about five minutes. All right. So 
we have, um, how about the future? What do you see in your future? Uh, the show's doing great. You know, s let's talk season 10 or, yeah. You know. <laughs> I like the <laughs> no, sound of that. Right. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, it's coming up, and yeah. The, the, I mean, the future is we, we, we will do the show as long as it's good. Yeah. And we'll try our best not to uh, limp out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for because we can make some more money. Um, you know, one of the things, when a show goes as well as this one has, we're, we all feel incredibly, incredibly lucky. And, but we feel the now the need to... Uh, to serve it well, you mm -hmm. know what's the legacy of our show? We have a chance to have a show with an actual mm, place in somehow in oh, yeah. history, I guess. I don't know. I don't want to mm -hmm. sound too full of ourselves, but but you know it's 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 so so we want we we care about its legacy, and you know we the writers we don't settle in the writers' room, you know the twelve brilliant writers who are in there. We don't we we don't settle. Yep. We, we don't say, well, it's good enough because like we're on Friday night and no one's watching. Like we go, no, all of our friends are watching and the whole industry is watching. We'll, we'll say to ourselves, waiting for us to fall on our asses and, and, and deliver a clunker. Let's not feed them any right. fuel, you know, for that, for that narrative. Let's, let's just keep continuing to get people to say, God, how did they do it again? That, and, and, and so we double down and we work harder to, to do that, I mean that's our that's that's what we do, and so, so the future for me is 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 to pro to, to to play whatever role mine is in protecting that the, legacy. the legacy of the show, um, uh, and and you know maybe that might involve some other things along the way, uh, you know, or, or allowing just because for my own creative sanity that I want to delve into some other things or produce something else. Um, Tangentially, um, you know, I, I'm directing a lot now, and uh, I'm um, I've gotten some offers to direct some features, and and time has not allowed for that. But you know, I I, I would like to do that um, when the time is right and the project is right. So uh, I don't know. Right now, it's just Modern Family. I, I uh, like one of your uh, comments when when you got the Emmy for directing, actually. Uh, you said that you had the best uh, crew and, uh, and and you had such a good crew that even an idiot can direct. Yeah, <laughs> that was kind of a yeah a thing. I mean, that's you know, it, and it also it's very it's very easy for me to step in and direct because I don't have me standing over me second guessing me, <laughs> uh, Great. which some of these other directors do. Uh -huh. uh, and that's a tougher position. So I, I, you know, I, I wanted to do it. I've directed some other shows I'd done, but it, I really enjoy it. And uh, um, you know, the, the cast pretends to like me <laughs> doing it. And uh, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's it's for me, it's direct contact. You know, yeah. when you're working a moment, there's not a game of telephone. Of I have to say to the director, "Hey, can we do this or do that?" Because at the end of the day, we're the final say mm -hmm. in TV. It's not the director, it's the executive producer. Is it more satisfying as a writer to direct your own words? I mean, like saying, oh, yeah, this is how I envisioned it. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, yes, it is. Uh -huh. But, but uh, I, I, I typically have played some role in the writing of, of whatever show that is. And now with Modern Family, you know, one way or another, you know, I feel I feel like I'm, you know, part of that, part of those characters. So I, I, I don't feel, I don't have to, I don't phone it in when I'm not, when I didn't write it or anything. But I think if it would be a little bit different if I didn't, you know, wasn't involved in the show, I just was hired to direct the show. You know, it would, I would have a different, whole different attitude because I don't have the same authority, frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to then defer to that executive producer. You know, I can't come and say, no, 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 I got this, you know, right. but on our show, I can, so it's a, it's a real luxury. All right, excellent. Uh, so let's take some questions. Come on, guys. Um, I would probably venture to guess that most of America is probably very happy that you were a failed news reporter, <laughs> uh, although there's probably one market out there that you would have ended up in that would have probably appreciated you being their reporter, but... 
there would have been some absurd stories on city council. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the list of, of shows that you've worked on, I mean, incredibly impressive, and you know that. You've also been a part of the TV industry during a time of seeing a lot of change, you know, um, especially in the probably the type of content that you develop. And I don't know how much of a risk you felt like you were taking with trying to get a show like Modern Family on a network. Um, but have things changed, I guess, from the beginning when there was really only three outlets that you really looked to create content for versus now? There's so many different opportunities that and niche um, sort of uh, 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 you know channels and outlets. Does that change the way that you think about anything? Well, it, it changes the possibilities. I mean, so far, uh, I'll be to be perfectly honest with you. I'm still, in a sense, swinging for the fences, which means I'm still looking. We're, I, I we're, or you know, Chris and I, for example, with Modern Family. We were hoping to do a show that would have wide appeal and also critical acclaim. Now we thought that we had taken some steps that probably would hurt us a little bit. You know, we thought, well, the single camera and the mockumentary style will turn some people off. Certainly, you know, Mitch and Cam's relationship would turn off some people in the, in this country, and that will marginalize our audience a little bit. And and, uh, uh, but I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, I haven't yet said, boy, I've got this project that it's only going to be niche, so therefore I better sell it to, try to sell it to HBO or to FX or whatever. I, so far, you know, my brain is still thinking about, is, is there another Cheers? Is there another, you know, show that can be both one I love, but also one that reaches, you know, Seinfeld or whatever, that, that reaches a, a large audience. You know, while, while it's still there. You know, the, while whatever is left of that large audience is still there. So I think that we're going to continue to fragment over time. It's going to get harder and harder and harder to reach those big audiences. So I'm interested in trying to get them while there's any mm -hmm. bit of them left. But I think it, it's a tremendous opportunity for, you know, especially for those writers who have that quirkier story, that smaller story, uh, you know, to, to like, you know, Arrested Development is a great example. You know, had Arrested Development gone on HBO, it probably would have run till he wanted to stop it. And it would have been considered a wild success in all accounts, by all accounts. Um, it's the fact that it was on a network, you know, that 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 particular type of storytelling just didn't was not able to reach a mass audience for whatever reason. So I think it afford it's a tremendous time of opportunity for for quirkier storytellers. It takes pressure off some people, you know. You what you know? It's a giant hit on HBO. I mean, if you look at the numbers for girls. You know, it is a tiny audience compared to, it, you know, it would have been, it would have lasted three, right. you know, I mean, those just by numbers alone, you know, it would have probably been off the air in three episodes. But because HBO is fine as long as it's buzzworthy and then they think it's got its quality or whatever it is, then they'll, they'll go with it. So I think that, that it's a great time, um, ultimately. It just might mean that we, those, those giant hits are going to be fewer and farther between. But going off from that and thinking, thinking about uh, the same thing applies to Mad Men. Mad Men is a great niche show with a very little Yeah, audience. I don't think that Mad Men right. would be at all sure. viable on network television. But then, then The Walking Dead comes, comes along. And then right. out, of the, out of that same niche, boom, it turns out that they have 10 million viewers right. and stuff like now, that. Now, then there's a whole other issue where Walking Dead couldn't quite be Walking Dead if it were on, on, on network, network because television. they would have to tone sure. it down a bit exactly. and you know, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that, that's a different reason, you know, because of content, you know. It's interesting, Modern Family, for example, it's a family show, right? Sure. So very rarely have we had to sense, like, we, we, we have occasional censor, you know, standards and practices issues. I mean, occasional. Because if it doesn't feel, we always watch, like, I, you know, I've always watched the show with my kids. Um, my other writers in our on our staff watch the show with their kids who are often very young. Um, 
we want it to be a, a family experience, but we also want it to be smart enough that certain jokes are going over those the kids' heads. <laughs> right. And, you know, so it's playing on multiple levels and all that. And um, uh, so it, there, it, when we do a show, uh, when, when there's a joke that's too dirty, you know, sometimes we go, oh, I don't know, I don't want to be sitting next to my daughter when that joke comes on, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and so we, we, we censor ourselves on that a little bit. But now, if we were doing a show about dating, like say, let's say we were doing you know, a show about, a, about three single guys living in New York in their 20s. Well, if you really want to do that show accurately and realistically, the language is going to be very different, the subject matter is going to be very different, the tone is going to be very, very different. And to do it well, you'd, you know, to do it accurately, you would probably want to do that, I'd want to do that on cable. Uh, where I could actually say what, speak the way kids, those, those, that age group speaks, as far as I know. <laughs> you know, they can say those groovy things, those <laughs> cats say. Uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, and, and to be able to just get into the, you know, a, a good story that involves sex or a good story, you know, like, I mean, you know, without having to worry about it too much. So, uh, Modern Family was perfect for network television because. If it feels weird to us, we probably don't want to do it anyway. So. What, uh, just real quick, uh, would love to get your thoughts um, from your perspective on uh, ha having run such a successful show uh, on like what's going on with Up All Night and all of that sort of, uh, from from a producer sort of standpoint. You mean when they try to turn it into a multicam? Yeah. I, thought it was, I mean, I, I thought that was the worst idea I'd ever heard. <laughs> I mean, I thought it was just a, 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 you know, terrible. It's a very, very talented cast. Um, I actually thought the show was good. Um, and you can't, you just can't do that. That'll never work, ever, ever, and ever. It didn't. it didn't work. It was, and, it, you know, it, it made everybody want to quit. And it, 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 it's not, you know, you can't cha do a change up like that. The audience has never, those things just never work. And the, the people who signed up for that show didn't sign up for that. You know, there are some people who say, I don't want to do, Multicam. I want to do single camera, vice versa. And, you, and in order to change it up, you got to give the. I think, to be fair, you got to give those people a chance to get out. They want, and then you know, then where are you? So I thought that was just a, a, a really bad idea. Okay. Sorry, the guy before me is tall, and I'm not. <laughs> so um, yeah, big fan, of course. I Thank mean, how, how could you not be? Um, I'm actually well, working. Well, you should talk to my wife. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But um, the last speaker, Craig and Jose, they're actually like the leaders of this TV think tank that we have here at DePaul. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've grown to appreciate television and production mostly, like far more than I ever did. And I want to thank Jose for that specifically. Um, but uh, Suck up. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Go, <laughs> go on, go on. But um, I know that you've done a lot of episodes for Modern Family. And I know, like personally, my favorite is Phil's Hunt for the Smoke Detectors. I don't know if anyone's seen that one, but that's just, that really hit my dad. Like, he's like, I've done that before, son. But <laughs> I wanted to ask you, from your perspective, like, what is the most heart-wrenching or, like, touched your heart episode of Modern Family? There are certain moments that I've loved. You know, uh, one of my favorite moments was very early on in the series when um, Manny, Jay and Manny had been together all day. They're still getting used to each other, and they got in a big, big fight, and... Jay's supposed to take Glory up to Napa for the weekend, and Manny's supposed to go to Disneyland with his real dad, and um, and he's got and Jay's got a limo coming to take him to the airport for Napa with Gloria, and he gets a call from Manny's, you know, screw up uh, father saying um, he can't make it, you know, he's he's playing poker game, he can't leave this poker table, he's on a run or whatever it is, and. Um, and Jay's got to go out to tell Manny who's waiting on the curb that his dad can't make it. And despite the fact that they've been fighting all day, rather than Jay saying, see, I'm not such a bad guy, your father's a big f up, he says, your dad called and he, he can't get here. He, there was only one seat left on a plane and he mm -hmm. gave it to this woman because she needed to get to see her husband who's not, or whatever it was. And 
And, and Manny says, yeah, that's not true, is it? And he goes, that's totally true. That's exactly what he did. He did the right thing. Your dad's a hero. And then the limo pulls up and he says, and look at this. He sent us a limo. He wants us to take you to Disneyland. <laughs> and so Jay ends up blowing off you know, the, the trip to Napa yeah. to take Manny to Disneyland. And you know, it's all done very quickly and quietly. But it's, you know, it, it's you know, a moment I, I love because it's you know, a guy just trying to do the right thing being a quiet hero you know little there are little things like that i mean i the the moment um one of my other favorite moments was um because it was based on <laughs> my daughter uh was when when they took haley when phil and claire took haley to college oh. and um mm -hmm. and and when you know for me th so we wanted to do a story about that and and i had uh just lived it uh, well, well, building up to it, though, I was very, very scared of the moment. Like, so you're looking for an in. So there's a moment. We're going to take the, you know, it's a milestone. So how do you not just do a, 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 the normal story, the, you know, the expected thing? Well, for me, the hook was I was just dreading the moment of saying goodbye. Because I was like, I'm going to cry, and, you know, I don't want to be standing in this dorm crying, and... You know, I mean, and everybody I knew was like going, I'm just dreading and I'm dreading. So the, I knew that dread was a universal feeling of like having to say goodbye at this moment. And so when we went, we, I got, there was all this, you know, the dorms, it was like trying to move stuff in and whatever. And I had to run, I kept getting sent to Bed Bath & Beyond like every 10 <laughs> minutes. And there was like, just go. And I'm like, why do we even <laughs> need this? And every time I go, I'd come back and they go, no, we need the different. And I, and I, we were getting in gigantic fights, you know, everybody, all of us. And finally, by the time we left, it was like, well, I'll see you later. Fine, bye. You know, we were all, like, just so pissed off at each other that it wasn't, it was like, good, you know, like, <laughs> see ya. And it, and it made it easier, but it also robbed me of that moment mm -hmm. that I, you know, was like, Ugh. So um, that's, that's was the hook for the story for me. That moment that Phil is dreading gets taken from him, and you know how do we bring it back in some you know cool, interesting way? So um, you know we're, that's the, what we you know what we try to do is like what's what's the unexpected? What's the what's underneath it all? You know, not just a silly story about this thing that happens and what's funny about it, but what's the real thing, the universal thing, the fresh look at this? Um, Underneath it all, that's what we're always looking for. I'm, I'm curious, and following up on that question, um, th do you still watch television? Do you, do you have time to watch television? I don't watch a lot. Oh, I, I watch the weirdest things. stuff. I watch home improvement shows and <laughs> car auctions and <laughs> you know <laughs> Golf Channel and stupid things. So I, I, to me, I mean, there are certain shows that I do you know really yeah. like to watch, and, and and you know some, but I but I it's a little bit like going back to work. Right, right, right. For me. So I, there's something I, I'm naturally like, uh, I don't want to. Because what, what I was thinking is that sometimes we're inspired, but we what we used to watch and moved us when we were younger, oh, yeah. well, right? Certainly. I mean, you know, I, Chris Lloyd and I both, you know, Cheers was a gigantic yeah. one for us. And Mary Tyler Moore and All in the Family and MASH and, um, you know, I mean, you know, some just basically smart shows that didn't talk down to the audience. Right, and right. You know, really tried to make you, we, the ones that we loved the most were the ones that not only made you laugh, but made you feel something. Mm -hmm. and that's what we kind of go yeah. for. I like that. Well, thank you very much. I was just trying to figure out what your take on it was. And Jose is always telling us, like, what is this story about and what are the characters about? And I think the Modern Family, it's about the connections you feel right. between your loved ones. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm part of your demographic that has only recently started to understand some of the jokes of the show. <laughs> um, my favorite episode is Halloween, featuring the length of uh, Mother Teresa's skirt. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I have a question about the general writing process. Um, you've seen the rise of fall and fall of multiple shows. Do you think that you've uncovered a sort of natural plan or like lifespan for a show? And what kind of signs are there to it? You mean like a length of how long it'll last? I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, there, there tends to be a, you know, seven, eight years tends to be 
when shows start to go south a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, the rare it's a rare show that really holds its quality much longer than that, to tell you the truth, in my opinion. You know, sometimes those shows can go a couple more years and in those seasons before the last one when they're wrapping everything up, there's still some you know, there's still good episodes, but it's sometimes they get a little sillier, a little broader and you know, just it's harder. Um, you know, especially with Modern Family where we're telling three, four stories an episode. So we've done 96 episodes and, you know, when you, if you, if you, you know, we've done probably over 300 stories in those 96 episodes. So it's hard, you know, it's going to continue to get harder. But, you know, as the kids age, that'll mm -hmm. open up some new opportunities for us. And, um, and we'll just have to continue to just work harder to find new avenues and not feel like we're repeating ourselves. That's a big danger. I yeah. wanted to know. I wanted to know uh, what it felt like on the inside when something like that happens, because sometimes even the audience can tell. For example, people tell me how I met your mother went south after like episode, like season six. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if that's also apparent on the inside, if you can tell. I think you start to get a feeling where you know. I mean, I, I'm, what I'm looking for now is like, what's this thing about this episode that's going to really excite me to, you know, to write it or be part of it or rewrite it or shoot it, like what's that moment that I, that real, oh, that's going to be great. And, you know, I think if you just stop feeling like you're just less engaged, you know, probably the audience is too. Um, you know, when you're really struggling, uh, you know, like, I don't know, Jay does this, like, you know, like that, you know, if you're ever getting into that moment, that, that place, then it's, you know, it's probably time if you have real integrity, you know, to hang it up. But, you know, you see shows go way past their prime because, the, you know, frankly, the money is just too hard, oops, I'm spilling, to too hard to resist at that point, mm. you know, it's just, it's just rolling in and it's hard, there's a whole machine in place and, you know, you get talked into keeping it going and there's also, you know, it's people's livelihoods, you know, you don't want to end, you got, we have 110 people on our crew, whatever it is, and, you know, those people that day we say, you know what, our integrity you know, it means more than your job. You know, that's a tough, that's a tough call to make. It's the sense of dragging it along. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very um, much. Going off on that, um, is there any rules or no-nos or you know? Uh, I understand uh, what she's trying to say in terms of, you know, we we have a structure. We know how to work. It wor works differently than other shows. But then, are there any special rules that you follow? Aside of having no, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, we're we're, we're juggling multiple storylines. Right. They all have to line up chronologically, so it's pretty tricky. Mm -hmm. You can't do one story that takes place over yeah. two hours, and you know, a Mitch Cam story that takes place over two hours, and a Dunphy story that takes place over three days. So everything has to line up, and so often it's a lot of math. You know, moving. Oh, geez, you know, we got to move this. What day is this? And uh, you know, do a lot of that. Right. Um, but basically, like you know. The alarm bells go off when people go, I've seen this, right. done it. You know, you know, often people go, I've seen it, and someone will say, I've done it, and then another <laughs> one else in the room will go, I've done it like five times. <laughs> you know, and that's true. You know, right, right. So you look for either you find a fresh way or, or because it's Phil doing it this time instead of right. Sam Malone doing it or whatever, it's a different spin. But... Um, you know, you just, you, we say, we often will say, well, that's really funny, but it just feels familiar. Like we, we need something else. But at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking about the scene of uh, Phil and Claire role playing on their anniversary. Mm -hmm. You went back to that one, right? Yeah. You did two on, of that. Yeah. Well, we, we like that. I mean, we like, we, well, we thought that was a cool thing that that's sort of a thing they do on their, <laughs> on their, um, anniversary. on their anniversary. Yeah, or, yeah, on their anniversary. So we, we, and we felt there was more comedy to mine there we may be done <laughs> i think we're probably With that <laughs> just flies yeah. and that's a couple it. things we've done uh where we said you know what it's probably time to let this Stop this it. go yeah. yeah a few little things we go and eh, we've done this to death let's let's <laughs> let it rest <laughs> let's 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 call time on this one before the audience does. Uh, you know, I, yeah gl i'm glad you did it I, because the second episode is really fun yeah too. yeah i mean yeah. i really like it yeah, when you get into the, oh boy, here we go again, then it's... Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Okay, so a couple more questions. 
Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the hiring process for writers on a show like yours. I know recently Megan Gans just joined the staff and how like, you contact people and the kind of criteria you judge new writers on. Well, we, we do this thing where we go to um, like colleges and then the first person to get up to the stage. Uh, and that's uh, great. great. Good, good, job. <laughs> good to know. Um, <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, <laughs> No, you know, I don't know. It's it's tricky. We Modern Family is is a very senior staff. It just is. When when the show went on the air, it was right after the writer strike. There were all the deals were kind of in town were over for a while and and there was a real opportunity there. And we had a lot of friends who were looking for something good to do and they were very senior and suddenly not able to command the money that they had before. And we were able to put together a very experienced staff. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, you know, obviously contributed wildly to the success of the show. You know, the average age of our staff is probably deep, deep in the 40s, <laughs> um, which is very old. I mean, I remember, what? I mean, it's very, it's very old for a staff. It's very old for us. Believe me, I mean, for a while, their staffs were... No, you know, right? The whole thing was like <laughs> I, in your in your twenties, you know, like all the they were like looking for you know, when during friends it was all it was all like we need writers in their twenties and, and and you did because those were the people who were out dating and living these lives and having great stories and taking out insane girls or going on a date with a really weird guy and those make great stories and and but for us we're we're looking for people who can tell stories about family. And you know, preferably raising kids and dealing with adult parents and all those issues. So those happen to come better from older people. That said, we're just always on the lookout for, you know, really funny people and and you know, especially, you know, there there is a you know I, I hate to say it, but there's a sh shortage of really funny women. Um, getting to us, let me say that getting to us uh there just is I, and i don't know what it is i'm not claiming by any means that men are funny or whatever but there's just fewer um you know really really i mean believe me the women who are very funny and who are accomplished and who have a strong voice are snapped up you know immediately because there are so many more guys you know when we were growing up we're all you know guys are trying to make each other laugh and girls are taught to be a bit you know, back then, a bit more, uh, have a long, don't spit milk out of your nose, but, you know, <laughs> we're all, meanwhile, we're cracking up. So uh, I think that, that it's changing because now there's some amazing, you know, female writers who are at the forefront right. and, you know, Mindy Kaling and, and uh, you know, um, Liz Merriweather and Tina Fey certainly, you know, pioneering and being so talented. It's really opening doors and, and encouraging women to write their voices and I think for so long women have been writing male voices and writing the like what the shows that they thought they should write and now you know it's okay for women to, to go okay well this is what I have to say Lena Dunham another one so um, but probably to more specifically answer your question <laughs> as I drifted away it's the, the key is you have to write scripts bottom line and I will say this I've said it before if you write a brilliant script, and if you write, if you write a brilliant script, it's going to get noticed. If you write two brilliant scripts, you're going to get hired. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot begin to tell you how many scripts I've read. You know, I've read for friends. I've read for you know my good friends' kids. My this, my friend of a friend. Da da da. People I've been supposed to hire, they're never good. Mm -hmm. They're just never good. They're never good. I I can't. Well, you know, this is the one that's going to be, <laughs> and it's not good. <laughs> and when, to, when you read a script that is good, it shocks you. And you can't get to the phone fast enough. Like, who the hell is this person, and why aren't they making my life easier right now? <laughs> so that's it. I mean, nothing else. I mean, it's good to be around a show. You learn, you know, get a job as a PA, get a job as a writer's assistant is a great job because you're – watching the process but it's hard to get and it's long hours and mm. it's you know hard to make the jump but people do uh elaine co on our staff this year won the writers guild award for best script and she was our former writer's assistant mm. so it happens but um you uh you can't there's no short there's no substitute you've got to write 
script. No one's going to hire you because like, oh, I'm a nice guy and I've got some funny ideas <laughs> or I'm, aren't, why, aren't I be fun? No, 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 it doesn't matter. You've got to be able to put, the, put it on the page. And I'll tell you this right now for those of you who are interested in writing, that first page better be funny. <laughs> and because we're looking, we're just looking for an excuse to go, yeah. this script. I'm, I, don't have I don't have time. I can't. I don't, I, it's, we're looking for, because I, so you get to page 10. I mean, it's a common thing, page 10. If I'm not laughing by page 10, I'm done. But, you know, I think that's now with how busy people are. I think, you know, you, you've got to be making, you better, you know, page one better pop. Certainly by page two. And if it does, you know, you're going to get noticed. There just aren't that many good scripts. There are, thou there are a million scripts, but there are very few really good ones. Thank you. All right, one more question. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, my question is, you, you have all of these fantastic episodes that kind of fit different categories. Like you have really great Halloween episodes or Valentine's Day episodes, and then you have great, you know, like parody or homage episodes, like the Godfather episode. Do you have a favorite kind of episode to write? Um, or do you just, or is that not a thing? No? No, I mean, other than, I mean, for me personally, I love an episode that comes from real life. But, you know, that's for my own, because I like seeing that, okay, I, you know, I or somebody on our staff saw a moment that happened when we're breaking the story, we're always going back to, well, what happened then, you know? And I could point to, you know, you know, and you build on it, you know, many of our best episodes have been from that. So I, I really, really, you know, like those episodes personally because I think they feel the most organic and I love when, again, when people say, oh my God, it's like you were in my house and I had mm -hmm. that same fight or that same thing happened to me. Well, I know then we're, we're you know, we're touching, you know, getting a nerve there. So those are my favorite, but, um, you know, if you ask the 12 of us on the staff, everybody would have a different answer. Great. All right, so great. Uh, let me just, uh, to close it up, uh, the the quote that I like the best about you, the, the God, I, I sound like such a liberal, comes out of a 2004 USA Today article where you were talking about Hollywood. Uh, in my research <laughs> for this, I found this awful, awful, awful page on the internet that's, that's called Celebrity Net Worth. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> right. And they, they, they uh, you know, have all of you celebrities graded, and, and you're in the $50 million Celebrity Net Worth. Don't believe that's what you read. I know, I know. <laughs> and and uh, it's a high contrast to what you wrote that time and what you talked about in, at that time. Um, one of the things that when you're a young writer, when you're in school, you're afraid to come or, or to write or to approach somebody because you, s you think that this is, well, he's worth 50 million. I'm probably worth 25, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so what? <laughs> uh, um, but you wrote against that. You said, ultimately, in Hollywood, we're people. Yeah, I, I, the point of that article was, I think it was when the Republican Party and conservatives were trying to dismiss the Hollywood elite yep. as, as like they're so out of touch that they don't know and they shouldn't be listened to or whatever because some people had to voice their political beliefs. And I certainly understand that point of view. No one really wants to hear what uh, Sean Penn has to say, but, um, <laughs> or Barbara Streisand, et cetera, et cetera, I can go on. But the point was, and I believe this to be true, and I think it's why Modern Family works, is, is at the end of the day, I mean, I grew up, okay, I grew up in Evanston and Glenview, um, and, and so I now live in L.A., and I grew up very differently than I live now, but my life is not different. You know, when you're raising kids, it's the same thing. You're you're worrying about, you know, them doing their homework. Are they do Are they healthy? Are they, are they are they, you know, socially adept? Are they, you know, getting into their getting along with people? Are you know, uh, are is the soccer field, uh, 
Uh, why is there a hole in the soccer field that my kid can step into and right. break his ankle? Why is uh, our dog our dog has run away? Um, you know, we're, uh, where are we going to eat tonight? What are we going to eat tonight? Uh, you know, the same exact things that my friends all over are are living. It's the same life. You know, your house might be bigger. Um, so what? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect the quality of your life at all. It's the same exact life. And uh, so we decided in the very beginning not to, I didn't, I didn't want to pretend. I didn't want to say, well, we're going to do Modern Family, but we're going to set it in, in Iowa, and they're going to be struggling, you know, with mm -hmm. unemployment and all that. I didn't, I didn't want to write that. I said, I'm not, I'm not living that. I want to write about our lives and because I, can, I know I can write it as realistically as possible. And by doing so, if we do it accurately, I know we're, we're gonna we're gonna t strike and you know we're gonna people are gonna relate to that because it's the same life. So the same fight that Claire is having with Haley, people are having oh, all over the world, <laughs> and not just all over America, but all over the world because we hear about it all the time. Right, right. And you know Jay may be kind of rich, but you know he's still struggling with a kid he doesn't understand. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. And so, you know, I said, I, I just don't, I'm tired of watching actors pretend to be poor. Right. You know, I just, that's not what these stories are going to be about. These stories are going to be, are going to be more positive and, mm. you know, maybe a, a bit aspirational. Um, and, and they're going to make, put people in a good mood and let them forget about their problems for a while. So the people who are struggling, and I don't diminish that at all, and I know some people are, and I don't mean to, you know, dismiss them, but you know what, those people, maybe more than anyone, deserve to be able to forget about their problems for a half hour. And, uh, and I've heard that repeatedly mm -hmm. from people. Thank you, you know, it's the happiest half hour of my week. Right. And uh, that's, that's great. So um, the point of that was, at the end of the day, we're all the same. Yeah, I like it. All right, I'll look. close with that. Thank you very much. For you. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. I truly appreciate it. My pleasure.